July 26th uh, to discuss uh, a couple of matters um, that um, before we get into the specific dockets, um, need to let folks know that uh, this hearing is being recorded and is live streamed on www.boston.gov slash city dash council dash TV and also on Xfinity 8 RCN 82 Verizon 964. It'll also be rebroadcasted at a later date. And specifically, the committee will hear the following dockets that I will now read into the record. Docket 0274, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $1,642,723.10 in the form of a grant for the fiscal year 2022 Senator Charles F. Shannon Community Safety Initiative awarded by the Mass Executive Office of Public Safety and Security to be administered by the Boston Police Department. The grant will fund regional and multidisciplinary approaches to combat gang violence through coordinated prevention and intervention, law enforcement, prosecution, and reintegration programs. That matter was referred to the Committee on Public Safety on February the 16th, 2022. Talk at 0348, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to expect, accept and expend the amount of $237,500 in the form of a grant for the fiscal year 2022 hazmat earmark awarded to the Massachusetts Department of Fire Services to be administered by the Boston Fire Department. The grant will fund decontamination equipment, uh, decontamination equipment, vehicle and maintenance expense for the hazard response team of the Boston Fire Department, referred to the Committee on Public Safety on March 9th, 2022. Talk at 0349, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $150,000 in the form of a grant, fiscal year 2022 COVID-19 SADV Trust Fund, uh, awarded by the Department of Public Health to be administered by the Boston Police Department. This grant will, be f will fund two full-time domestic violence advocates who will work with social service agency partners at the BPHC Family Justice Center, referred to the Committee on Public Safety on March the 9th, 2022. Talk at 0375, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $555,166.40 in the form of a grant for the Federal Fiscal Year 20 Assistance to Firefighters Grant awarded by the Federal Emergency Management Agency to be administered by the Fire Department. This grant will fund safety training and fitness equipment to support officer health and wellness referred to the committee on March 16, 2022. Mayor Wu sponsored all of these dockets um, and just have it noted that if members of the public would like to provide public testimony, they can sign up uh, in the sheet near the podium to my left. Members of the public may also provide testimony via Zoom or provide written documents to the committee that will be made part of the public record and shared with all of the councilors. Members of the public should also email Christine O'Donnell at christine.odonnell at boston.gov to request testimony link for public testimony via Zoom. Members of the public can also email the committee at ccc.ps at boston.gov to provide written testimony. I'd like to stress that we need information for people who are providing public testimony via video conference, especially if you're dialing in with a phone number or if you have an unrecognizable username. So please make sure that your name uh, appears clearly on Zoom. Uh, and with us today, we're going to take the fire uh, grants uh, for us with us today. Uh, we have our uh, new uh, commissioner of the Boston Fire Department. That's Commissioner Paul Burke. Uh, welcome, Commissioner. We're also joined by Chief of Operations, uh, Rob Calabrese. Uh, we're also joined by Chief of Operations, Rodney Marshall, and Deputy Commissioner Kathleen Judge. Uh, welcome to all of you. And uh, we'll dive right into um, the uh, first, um, first grant, which is going to be uh, docket 0348 and that's the uh, for the hazmat so uh, whoever would like to take the floor and just uh, give us introductory uh, comments I can speak on that mr. chairman Thank you. Uh, Bob Calabrese Boston fire um, that was actually my prior division so I'm pretty well versed Perfect. on it um, they uh, each year the state gives us a uh, Department of Fire Services a grant for 237,500 been that amount for a number of years um, most of the time, we, are, um, we have to rotate our vehicles. Uh, we have four hazmat technicians that respond to incidents both on and off duty. So we have to rotate those incidents. They have a significant wear and tear each year. So a good, uh, we always try to rotate them where each tech gets a new one every four or five years. So uh, this year would be one um, allocated for 67,000, a 2022 Chevy Tahoe vehicle. It's outfitted with all the equipment and materials that they need to mitigate any hazmat incident they respond to. 
In addition to that, the suits that they wear are totally encapsulated um, and they're geared to, towards responding to any hazardous spill or solids, liquids, or gases that we may come into uh, during the normal course of a day or on an, or off duty. So we have 20 level A hazmat suits. Again, they're totally um, immersed from the environment. Um, they're, they're totally protected in these and they have to be with some of the chemicals that are out there and the amount of $46,000 for 20 hazmat suits. And there's a specialized piece of equipment um, to, used to improve their efficiency for solid uh, gas and liquid determination. It's a red wave gas spectrometer in the amount of $125,000. So that's very, very close. I'm not a math major, but please <laughs> bear with me, but it's approximating the amount of the grant for the 237.5. That's great. And then does that hazmat unit, does that respond to every single sort of working fire in case that they do uh, come across something or are they sort of uh, on standby in the event that you do? And then only, if it's, um, only if it's, uh, there's a suspicion of a chemical that's, um, that was detected from the gas meters, then they'd call that unit in. Mm -hmm. But other than that, regular fire is probably not, but um, some type of, like a lot of labs are in the city of Boston, colleges, and labs, like if there was a spill or a mishap there, that could be used to determine that. And it's very, it's a very highly state-of-the-art piece of equipment that could be used for it. And uh, they would respond to anything that's called for by the incident commander that is a suspicious, suspicious nature in form of chemicals uh, that could be used for that as, as well. And we have obviously a significant number of labs uh, that call Boston at home. I believe there's somewhere in the vicinity of 13 to 15 million square feet of, of lab demand where the city may be able to accommodate maybe six to eight million of that. And we're starting to see labs um, start to encroach a little bit more into the sort of the residential community uh, in some of those older warehouse or commercial buildings. Is there a, a division of the fire department or is there a unit that sort of oversees and or inspects um, these labs on a regular basis just to see what, you know, uh, I guess what's inside the building, what type of materials and chemicals are they using, how are they storing it, at what temperature, et cetera? Right. Uh, yeah, we do have a, um, uh, fire prevention does have lab inspectors uh, that go around to, at these specialized type of um, equipment, uh, particularly in the colleges. And they also, um, we have a department chemist as well that can identify some of these labs for them to follow up on it to inspect. So it's, um, it's kind of like working together cont mm -hmm. contiguously to, to do that. But the, the labs, um, it, it could be overwhelming sometimes with the, the amount of them. So each college has one, you know, if they have chemistry and all that. Yeah. So it's a lot of work. These guys really earn their, earn their keep, to put it, put it mildly. And then, uh, like a situation like today, I, be, I believe there was a, a crane collapse somewhere in Dorchester, and if that crane is like leaking, whether it's hydraulics or other type of fuel, that would be sort of a situation where hazmat would be notified and they would show up, or, or would it be an individual engine or ladder company be able to handle that? Yeah, uh, that's considered a technical rescue um, event, anything like that. That's like, uh, I had two divisions under me. I had the hazmat and technical rescue. And that's kind of like a, a specialized thing. Uh, you have tech rescue companies that are, are trained specifically in the, uh, we, we have trench rescue, we have confined space, we have high angle rescue. Uh, the, the floor collapse a few months ago at the old power plant in Southie, yep. they, they responded to that and they were all specially trained to, to respond to that. So. Uh, they responded to that as well. Thank God it was of a, no one was hurt there today, and it was a minor nature. It was, it was kind of wrapped up pretty quickly, thank God. So. And then, obviously, given the demands of the labs that you've stated um, and, the, and the sort of, I guess, the pressure that's put on the department, in addition to what we know uh, is coming down the pike with the 13 to 15 million square feet of demand, I guess, is, is, is the fire department seeking additional grant funding um, due to the rise uh, in, in life science and in lab space. And yeah, def definitely. We would definitely be, be seeking that, sure. Um, does anyone uh, here uh, wishing to offer public testimony on this docket, uh, docket 0348, may do so now. Forever hold your peace. Seeing and 
hearing no desire to testify on this. Um, I appreciate uh, that, Chief, on uh, docket 0348, in which time uh, we'll now move to the second docket uh, pertaining to the fire department, which is docket 0375, and that is the uh, grant, the $555,166.40 for the Emergency Management Agency uh, for training and fitness equipment. So if you can maybe touch base a little bit on the uh, health and wellness uh, of uh, our firefighters and uh, or, or to the commissioner, whoever. Very good. Thank you, Commissioner. So once it's beeping, you can talk. Just keep just talking. It'll pick you up. The Boston Fire Commissioner. This grant is um, from FEMA. It's for firefighter health and safety. So far, this grant, it, we matched it with 55000 so the total grant was 610683 Out of that, we spent 209000 on equipment. And that would be exercise equipment that went to each firehouse. It would be a treadmill for each firehouse. And we still have the remainder left, which we are going to use for a program to train new officers. When a firefighter becomes a lieutenant, he's really not schooled in management and how things are run. So we send them to school. It's called a JOLT program that they train how to be officers, what they have to look for, how to treat their subordinates and permitting and items like that. That's what they train them with. So the remainder of the grant will be spent on that. And is this, uh, this funding, is it, uh, is it consistent with previous grant funding for the department in, is that in years past? Yes. We, we certainly try to request funds from AFG yes. when there's funding opportunities that are high priorities. And in this case, so it can be different things depending on their priorities, but this latest priority was around fitness for firefighters and also for officer training. And obviously, I know there's been an emphasis over the last several years um, as the longest serving member of the city council. I know that this had never really been a priority uh, until uh, most recently, which is the health and wellness of, of, uh, of men and women that uh, serve on the, on the fire department. And even when you listen to a fire command, uh, you see how the um, whoever's, uh, I guess, the chief at the scene or even you as commissioner being there, how they're, SWAT, they're timing um, how many, how often or how long folks have been in a building or have been on the roof or in the basement, uh, which I, it's, I always find it to be very interesting. And, and then you have the uh, fire alarm keeping track of the time uh, that that particular company or unit has been in there. And then you or whoever's got the command at the time will, will rotate and swap them out so that they're, you know, not exposed maybe to the hazards, unlike you know, say five, 10, 15, 20 years ago. And if you think about sort of the, you know, the, the cancer and the, and the, uh, and the uh, heart ailments that have come from the hazards of the profession of the job, uh, hopefully we're gonna start to see uh, them reduced significantly based on focus on health and wellness of the members, as well as uh, how, you, uh, how you're operating the command uh, at a fire scene. Yeah, Commissioner Finn established the Health and Safety Division in 2015, and it's really been great for all of us. They have industrial cleaning of firehouses to get the toxins out. Um, the, the gear is washed. The, the, a private company gave us, um, was the Last Call Foundation, run by Michael Kennedy's mother, gave us washing machines that strictly do just the bunker gear. There's been a lot of safety things that have been added. That fire in East Boston, they, they rotated a lot because they were sucking so much air out of their tanks because of the heat and the, the, the smoke was terrible in there. So it, it was very important to get them in and out of there. So Even the devices that are on the, uh, the trucks as they're leaving the stations, you can you see the truck will pull out and then it'll sort of snap off yeah, the that, exhaust pipe, which diesel the, fumes and, you know. That's uh, correct. The World Health Organization, which is monitoring all the health issues with COVID and everything, they declared uh, diesel particles a uh, carcinogen. They used to be presumed carcinogens, then they changed to they are carcinogenic uh, activity, so we can't have them going up the pole holes and it fits into the furniture yeah. and the walls yeah. and everything, so that's a big deal. So every station, with. every firehouse every has one, one of those, and as well as the washing machines for the uh, for the bunker gear and the equipment and, yes, and all sir. that, that's uh, great. Yeah. And uh, Council President Flynn and I, we grew up at uh, uh, 
couple of guys, the twins from, from our neighborhood, they're actually LA firefighters. Uh, oh, I met them, yeah. yes, yes. The one has risen, I think, Reese most recently was just named, I think, battalion chief, and the other one, I believe, might be a captain. But one of the things they told us about is that they have, uh, I believe out in LA, they have annual physicals and stress tests with blood work and et cetera to sort of make sure that they're maintaining, uh, you know, their health obviously is, is of paramount importance, checking for any early signs, any early detection uh, of whether it's a heart or um, any uh, cancer ailments, uh, as well as making sure that, you know, the, they're staying fit, uh, physically fit for the demands of the job. And they've seen obviously a re reduction in uh, folks being out of work, et cetera. So hopefully uh, we can continue down the, down the wellness path and yes. maybe at some point have a situation where, you know, each one of our firefighters gets an annual uh, physical, I guess, where they are. Currently, they do get they an do annual physical. Perfect. Optional or man mandatory? It's optional, but the city of Boston, uh, I'm grateful they provide some funding. If you get it, you prove it every year right. to the safety and wellness division that you got a physical, then you have a stipend put in your check every week. That's great. So it's really great. fantastic. That's great. The Mullins brothers are good guys, That's too. Great. I met one on the beach out there. He was responding to a call, and we had a great conversation. Okay. Their uncle, uh, Danny Mullen, and me were hired together here. No fooling. It's answer. fantastic. Yeah. 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 Danny and I grew up playing hockey yeah. and baseball with him. <laughs> he so. told me, make sure I watch that show, uh, the Seattle Fire Department, because he was a consultant on yeah, it, yeah. Mullen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He knows a lot yeah. of big people yeah. up there, yeah. I'll tell you. We're out in L.A., so they oftentimes get asked to Oh, they're uh, partying with them, too, yeah. I think. Yeah, they're at the mansions yeah. at all the functions. I know that. That's fine. Yeah, pretty nice guys. Yes. Well, Fantastic. So, Council President Flynn, any questions on the two firefighter dockets? Uh, we've got uh, the one we're dealing with now is docket 0375, and the one we had just previously spoke about on hazmat is 0348. You have the floor. Yeah, thank, thank you, Council Flaherty, and thank you, Council Flaherty, and thank you for your leadership on public safety issues. And Council Flaherty, also, you really were our the, the strongest leader on the fire department in health and wellness and support of firefighters. I think I think you got that, Council Flaherty, because your father was an outstanding supporter of um, Boston firefighters as as well. So I just want to. Acknowledge that Representative Flaherty, his father, really carried carried the ball on health and wellness programs. Uh, Commissioner, uh, thank you for you and your team for for being here for the important work that you are doing. I had the opportunity to to um, <clears throat> attend the opening of the new firehouse on, I believe it was Columbus Avenue, correct, uh, Jamaica Plain, Eggleston Square area, and I was impressed with that with that firehouse in terms of the the setup where it was so environmentally environmentally friendly. I saw the um, washing machines, um, the cleaning machines. Um, my, my question is, Commissioner, um, I know you mentioned all of those, all of the houses now do have those cleaning machines for the, for the clothes, for the equipment, uh, for the jackets and the, the pants and the suits. Um, but, but Houses that don't have that, uh, that, that um, are not as environmentally friendly as the one that just built, what type of, even if they have those machines that do, that do the cleaning, what type of um, environmental challenges do the firefighters have um, working and living in that firehouse? Well, it's important that they don't take any of that gear upstairs. The, mm -hmm. That gear has got toxins in it, so we try to make sure they isolate the gear, the signs all over the building, do not take your bunker gear above the first floor. We make sure the poles have flanges on them where you slide down the pole to keep the fumes from going up from the, when the engine starts up. Um, just general clean, they have to take a shower after every fire to get the toxins off them. We have handy wipes at the fire scene to wipe down any carcinogens on their skin. There's a lot of precautions we're taking to try and get the toxins off them as fast as we can. So that new firehouse you're talking about has steam showers to try and get clean their pores out also. So. Okay. And, and that being said, on that line, we, we're hoping to uh, break ground on a new firehouse in Meeting House Hill in September. Mm -hmm. It's moving along very well, and I hope you guys will be there for breaking ground on that. And then we'd like to move to the south end to go to Engine 3. because. Uh, 
I believe your uncle was at Engine 3. It's That's a, right. Yeah, I was the captain there for years. It's a great firehouse. Right, it is. It's right beside the police station. I have a lot of ideas. I'd like to make it a really environmentally safe firehouse. I, I always had to change the flag on the roof. I tell people this all the time because the cathedral created a wind tunnel. And I always thought if we ever went green, we could get a nice windmill up there and generate the police yeah. department and the firehouse right there for electricity and get free electricity, thanks to the Catholic Church, because of the wind tunnel they created with the height of their buildings. So, right, right. So keep that in mind when I come looking for funds for a new Engine 3. Yeah. We could name it the Flynn Firehouse, the Dennis <laughs> Flynn Firehouse. It's a good idea. You yeah, good I idea. think so. <laughs> um, thank, you, thank you, Commissioner. Um, so, so when, when a firefighter in, in, a, in, a, in a truck returns back, I know you talked about how they can um, improve, improve their, um, their quality of life and health by taking certain precautions, but is there anything that the fire department does in terms of industrial cleaning at that firehouse over a period of time, maybe once every I don't know, three months or once, it, once, a, once a quarter or once every year. Is there some type of industrial cleaning that yes. takes place? There's, we have a program of industrial cleaning where we close down the firehouse. We come in, they scrub down the walls three times and then they paint everything. They get rid of the furniture, any cloth furniture goes out into the trash and they put non-porous furniture in so the toxins don't adhere to it. So I have uh, engine 28 is closed in Jamaica Plain right now just for that. And the arson squad, believe it or not, is attached to fire headquarters. Arson investigators tend to go into a fire after the fact, mm -hmm. and they don't always have their breathing apparatus on because the, the air is cleared, but it's really not. They get a lot of particles in their lungs. They bring a lot of stuff back to that building, so that's under the process of getting clean now, too. And we, we keep this program growing. Along with this, we are creating uh, sleeping areas, private sleeping areas mm -hmm. for uh, new firefighters, the females. So every firehouse is going to be retrofitted with private rooms. So it's, there's no issue with gender. Yeah, thank, thank you, Commissioner Wright. Um, so Commissioner, when you, when you do that industrial cleaning, do you send out the, um, the chemicals that were scraped from the walls? Do you, do you send that out to an environmental company just to test it to see what's on it, what's on the walls, which means what what the firefighters have been traditionally breathing in. Do we do we do any environmental testing on it? No, we do not. Okay. Um, the, the the three things that are done: the cleaning of the walls and the ceilings, the painting, and then this ductwork is cleaned out because the ductwork is full of really bad things that are in there, so they clean that out too. Those three items are done at each industrial cleaning. And I, I think I know the answer, but I want to I ask it anyway, but when a firefighter traditionally has been breathing those fumes and chemicals in at the firehouse over 20, 30 years, um, maybe they started at 22, 23, 24 years old, but <clears throat> They may retire early. They may. They may not. But what is their, what, what is the health impact, Commissioner, of living in those old firehouses for a long period of time, um, and then a firefighter retires and maybe, you know, they go through the medical clearance program. But what is the, what are we seeing from firefighters when they retire that have been exposed to those types of chemicals pretty much their whole adult life? Uh, they have a reduced lifespan after they retire. We average about five years of retirement. So uh, the exposure is harmful to everybody. It's, it's terrible. If we can do anything we can to reduce it, we're trying. The, the, the engines, if you have a fire and you have an engine out there, the guy's working on that engine, just one man, he's pumping the water, he's making everything happen. It used to be there was an exhaust pipe right there. He's sucking in a diesel exhaust yeah. the whole time. So we changed that to the other side of the truck. There's, there's a lot of things that have come up that we've wow. fixed in the past. So hopefully that helps. No, thank you, Commissioner Ron. Yeah, five years. So that's the average. That's correct, Bob. Uh, yeah, it's average five years. 
Nobody should have to right. have a shortened retirement because the profession they chose, you know. Probably the average, average is about 20 years, I would say, um, outside of public safety agencies. I would think so, yeah. Well, my mother's 98 years old, so yeah. <laughs> she's been retired a long time. Right. <laughs> um, no, this information is, is helpful. I, I asked these questions, Commissioner, because I, I know the I know the answers and like like Michael does, but I think it's also important that we educate the public as well to know, you know, it's important for the public to know the the health effects of, of, of fighting a fire, but also living in these old firehouses for a period of time certainly has a significant impact on on the firefighter and their family. Um, so let me, let me ask one, one final question. Um, you know, in, in the military com commissioner, I'm just, I'm just thinking out loud a little bit, but um, Agent Orange and some of these being exposed to chemicals while, while in the military, but you can, unfortunately, if, if you're exposed to it, your kids, when you have children, your kids could also have some type of health-related issues based on some of the chemicals, unfortunately, that have been in your, in your body um, while serving in the military. I'm just thinking out loud, is, has there ever been any studies where um, children of firefighters, um, they've, that unfortunately, they've passed on those, um, some of the, those harmful health-related issues to their children through, yeah. um, through, through living in these firehouses? Uh, not that I know of. No, I'm not sure of that one. Um, I can say that furniture has changed over the years. Furniture used to be made of cloth years ago. Now it's petroleum-based, so every room that catches on fire, they're sucking in petroleum-based uh, smoke and soot, and it's, mm -hmm. it's worse than it ever was. So that, and they also ignite quicker. Years ago, it would take 20 minutes to, for a room to catch on fire that's made out of cloth. Now it's less than 10 minutes. It's fully engulfed in flames, and that smoke is a lot worse and toxic than it was 20 years ago when it was just clothing, um, cloth upholstery burning. Now it's plastics, and yeah. so it, it's a very toxic smoke. I, I, Same with automobiles, too, with all the plastic. Remember when they were kids, they had metal dashboards. Now yeah. everything's plastic. Yeah. and. That's pushing heavy petroleum-based smoke, yeah. and everybody's breathing it. My, thank you, Commissioner. My final comment, it's not really a, a question, but something that I know Council of Flaherty supports me on, is I, I, think it's, I think it's critically important for the city to make plans, have a discussion about a new, fi a new fire headquarters. That current location is is obsolete, the, the building is obsolete. Um, like like the police department, I think the, the fire department should have a state of the art um, headquarters um, and also the main, you know, upgrade the maintenance department as well in the arson department. But having, having a state of the art fire headquarters is critical for the long term of, of, of the city, I think, in my opinion. Um, Council Flaherty, I have no further questions. Just want to say thank you to the to the commissioner and to the commissioner's um, very professional, hardworking team that he has here, and the men and women of the fire department throughout the city. Thank you, Council President. I would obviously concur with that, uh, along with uh, trying to get Car Five back uh, oh. up and running. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, to, yeah. Mr. President, we we really appreciate both your efforts on our behalf. Really. Um, You'll President Flynn called me the other day, I think Pre uh, Chairman Flaherty, about the fires in East Boston. Your concern about our members is really something that touches us all. We really appreciate Thank it. You. You know, Thank you. They, they don't get recognition as much, but when you call and say, how's everybody doing, that means a lot. I pass it on to the membership. Thank thanks. you very much, both And as of you. Chief uh, Calabrese was saying, that the average of five years, I, and this is probably more of a, f a function of 718, but making sure that those members check um, box C uh, for their spouses and families, oh, yes. uh, given sort of what we know, um, having the historical perspective of it, plus the Absolutely. hazards of the profession, and anyone that uh, I guess at this stage of the game is not checking off box C uh, for their spouse and children needs to maybe be redirected to 
upstairs to pension retirement to reconsider that. But um, anyone wishing to offer public testimony at this point may do so. Uh, speak now or forever hold your peace. Seeing no, in hearing no desire for public testimony and checking in with Christine, is there anyone on Zoom? So um, uh, again, uh, first of all, congratulations again, uh, Commissioner, you. to you and obviously to your, uh, your chief team here and uh, we've, uh, and the experience that you've been able to tap into and uh, so the department's in great hands. Uh, we've always we've been beneficiaries of great commissioners over the years and so based on your training and experience and the team that you put together, obviously along with uh, Deputy Commissioner Kathleen Judge, who is a staple down here. Um, <laughs> I think I've been I've been in this chamber as long as you have. Yeah. I think so. Uh, Can we get her so a raise? We appreciate yeah. you guys yeah. helping out. Yeah. Get her a raise. She yeah. deserves a double yeah. raise. She does <laughs> combat yeah. pay. Yeah, Bobby will, will back yeah. me up on that. Yeah, <laughs> she's the best. Which is great. So obviously, yeah. it's great to see you as well. And uh, so, with respect uh, to uh, docket zero three seven five and docket zero three. 4-8, uh, the Committee on Public Safety will adjourn those hearings and look forward to having an expedited committee report for our next session, which, if I'm not mistaken, will be August the 10th, correct, Mr. President? It's, it's mid-August. Mid-August, yeah. and we'll get these reported out and then uh, get them over to the Mayor's office to sign them. So, again, congratulations. Great to see you, Commissioner, and obviously, Chief and much. Chief, look forward to working with you as we do with the Deputy Commissioner. Yep. Thank you. Enjoy Thank the you. rest of the afternoon. You too. Thank be you. Be safe. Thank you. And good afternoon to our friends over at BPD. Uh, always great to uh, see uh, Captain Therese Kamiski and um, Maria Chivas and is it Timon? Timon uh, Bill's uh, project coordinator of office research and development. So, um, it's fine. We do. Yeah, we do it right. Yeah. If everyone's comfortable, is everyone comfortable here? We can yeah, focus on that. Perfect. Uh, so we're obviously we're here to discuss uh, a couple of dockets. Uh, one is docket zero two four seven, which is the Shannon Grant. And, uh, and then there's docket 0349, uh, which are uh, the SAVD grants uh, from the Boston Public Health Commission. So without further ado, uh, whoever chooses to sort of dive right into um, 0247 first. That's myself. Perfect. <clears throat> so the, the Shannon Grant Funds um, support the city of Boston's comprehensive strategy aimed at reducing gun gang and youth violence in the city by providing services and interventions to at-risk and gang-affiliated youth within these neighborhoods. Um, for the past 15 years, 16 I believe this year, um, the city of Sh Boston Shannon Grant has built a successful collaboration balancing city, community, faith-based social service and law enforcement partnerships within the community using the following elements. Opportunity provision, social intervention and prevention strategies, community mobilization and organizational change and development. In 2015, um, we introduced a comprehensive, I mean, a competitive RFP process um, for organizations to apply for Shannon funds, um, opening up the grant to all the nonprofits that are around Boston, um, specifically within our neighborhoods, um, that are affected by violence and the highest rates of violence. Um, and so we're, we're trying, what we try to do is kind of get more organizations to apply. Um, even though we have a limited amount of funds every year, we try to kind of keep it updated but we still have those, those proponents that are crucial to the Shannon funding. Um, those specifically would be um, BCYF Centers, um, Boston Public Health Commission, um, YLU Boston, um, uh, and the newly uh, appointed the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office, Boston Medical Center, VIAP, and, y I mean, and um, Youth Connect. Um, those, those proponents are kind of the cornerstones of the Shannon um, there's six of them, and then we try to fill in the rest, at almost at least uh, 25 organizations every year. Um, so the rest of them will be open to the, to the public. And we have, a, through that RFP, we usually get about 50 applicants a year um, on a low year. At the beginning, we had 120. Um, and then the city, and we kind of came up with youth development grants to counterbalance the Shannon because we had so many people that couldn't get funding. From Shannon, um, so we had that, and they, they kind of work in concert. Um, the the other component of Shannon would be the SSYI grant, um, and that is very specific. Um, it has you know youth that are proven risk, we like to call it, and then Shannon would be high risk um, and, and at risk. So every year we probably have about 
1,500 youth that get served through Shannon Grant, either either with stipends or with summer jobs or with programming. Mm -hmm. um, through this, so we have seen since its inception in 2006 to the end of 2020, um, a 15, a 16% percent decrease in homicides, 9% decrease in aggravated assault, and a 10% decrease in total violent crimes um, through an, invis an initial investment of about $350 per young person. Mm -hmm. um, so this year's applicants, um, or this year's awardees, I, like I was saying before, Boston Medical Center VIAP, BCYF, Boston Public Health Commission, Wild U Boston, um, Suffolk County District Attorney's Office, Youth Connect, um, College Bound Dorchester, Hyde Square Task Force, Sportsmen's Tennis, Mothers for Justice and Equality, uh, My Life, My Choice, Strive, uh, More Than Words, Project Right Inc., ROCA, Young Man with a Plan, Maverick Landing, The Freedom House, The Ella J. Baker House, and The Chica Project. Um, those are the awardees of this year. We're trying to, we try to have about 20 to 25, like I said, every year. Um, anything more than that is just uh, logistical, it's, yep. it's, it's harder for us to do. Shannon Grant is an annual grant, and it's not on the fiscal year. Um, we're funded through EOPS, so they, they give us a January 1st to December 31st for spending only, and it ends after that. It's a hard cutoff. Um, and so this year we had awarded again uh, $1,642,000. Um, each, each partner besides those cornerstone partners uh, receive a, up to $45,000. In addition, we also fund um, different units within the police department. That would be the drug control unit, homicide unit, um, youth violence strike force, street outreach unit, and the community policing unit. Right. Um, within the Shannon Grant, it's um, two staff members, that'd be my, my, my salary, and 10% for a data analyst. Um, and that's, right. that's the Shannon Grant in the right. whole. Well, thank you for your thorough testimony question if you don't use it you lose it you have a, so it's Correct. somewhat time sensitive if we don't use it we lose it and if let's say an organization um, you know they had they budgeted for a certain amount and then they couldn't spend all that we would have to return that to the state okay and I like that uh, sort of you're looking and encouraging more groups and organizations to apply so uh, just a couple questions at front I guess how does the department determine their community partners how many of those partners are reoccurring partners in I guess, what are the metrics? What key performance indicators do, do you guys use to measure a successful partnership? And uh, not in this particular situation, but we do right. see across the city from time to time, it's the, it's the sort of the same groups and the same mm -hmm. organizations, uh, arguably turning into fiefdoms and Correct. kind of protecting their territory and telling everyone to kind of hands off. And, but to some degree, some have outlived their usefulness or are no mm -hmm. longer effective anymore, and they're just kind of they're sort of first in because they know how it works, whereas you might have a competing organization that uh, may be adding more value or, you know, has a bigger reach and a stronger network. They're just newer, uh, may not know how to apply for these, or they're getting sort of pushed out by sort of the... Uh, the, the new uh, flashy yeah, things. The, yeah, yeah, so it's, I guess, so for me, I, you know, I'd want to see sort of, I guess, what, what are some of those metrics, what are some of those measure, measures and deliverables that you guys would base it on, say, hey, this is a this is a worthwhile group and organization and they're making a difference and we need to sort of continue to, to, to fund them versus, hey, this is a group that's kind of been at it for a long time and maybe a little bit off the curveball and off the fastball and, you know, we may want to start to move in a direction. But so I, I like the idea that you're casting the wide net and trying to get more folks involved. You don't want it to be too big and unwielding because you need to manage it. Uh, but we also want to make sure that there's some new blood and some new energy Correct. and there's some, uh, you know, I guess a, a new perspective on you know, whether it's crime and violence or youth violent crime or so that'd be great and I, again appreciate your testimony if and that would be my that's my only question which is sort of a opine but two or three questions right. wrapped up in one well we, we there is a metric that we have to um, from the state they there's a program evaluations um, twice a year um, things that they're going to be looking for like the amount of youth served um, there's a pre and a post um, survey that they give to young people that are involved in their programming um, but you still have programs, some places like sportsmen's tennis, for example, um, they serve a wide swath of young people and they do not have a very, they do not have like a, a intake form that's so formal. Um, they, they, they welcome all takers. Um, but then you have something that's a very, very focused like Youth Connect um, and they have a, a intake form for their young people. It's a social, social work based program. So they will be serving 
a very, very limited amount of young people, but a very, very uh, focused group. Um, in Shannon, we also try to make sure that we, we don't have too many programs that are similar. Um, so we wouldn't have um, an MMA and a wrestling program at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, we wouldn't have more than two basketball program basketball leagues. Um, we try to kind of stretch it out. Um, but in Boston, it is, it, like you said, it's very small. Um, we do have programs that are that just do well at certain things, and you really, sometimes you just can't get away from that. They just they're the best at this thing. Um, and then you have again programs that are that come up every year. They're brand new and they're shiny and they're beautiful. And they shine bright for that one year, and then the next year it's a little bit different when they don't get the funding. Right. Um, so how we kind of combat that is we have to make sure that programming, um, programs that we do um, give funds to, they already have a track record. Um, we're not trying to fund somebody to say, I have this new idea and bright idea for this program. Um, it, would be, we, it would be lovely to do that, but we can't really do that because if, we, if they don't get Shannon funds and they can't mm -hmm. exist as a program, it's not really successful. Um, but for the metrics for, for us, we try to make sure that there's, um, again, we're following the, the EOPS guidelines. Um, I, I can send that to you, the questions that they ask for us and the things, the metrics that we have. Mm -hmm. um, that's on their website, on the EOPS website. Great. They have it every single year for, for Shannon. So we do two program evaluations through the year, as well as um, we do track through violence because Shannon Grant is a violence prevention. Um, so we, we will follow, we follow those very closely, too. Thank you. Do you recognize this council, President Flynn? Any questions of Demont? Yeah, thank you. And thank you for, the, for your presentation and for the important work you're doing. Thank you. I had, well, before I was a city council, I was a probation officer for 10 years, and some of the community partners you mentioned, are some of the partners I've worked with, and they all have an excellent reputation. Mm -hmm. um, especially on reentry and helping helping people coming out of jail or prison mm -hmm. um, to get the critical services and support that they they need um, so my question my question is what is what is the city doing um, or or how can we how can we assist in in that reentry process and what is your team doing so people coming out of jail or people coming out of prison almost have a flawless plan where they have housing they have access to um, medical care or or the ability to get their driver's license or birth certificates mm -hmm. you know those simple things that we often take for granted um, are are challenging at times but would anything in this grant um, work towards the reentry of, of um, men coming out of jail or men men coming out of prison? I, I do believe that um, within our programs, um, College Bound Dorchester had a reentry um, program through the Boston on Corner project. Um, I do believe Roca had a, mm -hmm. a reentry esque kind of program, um, but this one is different. We in our department, at one point we had reentry. I'm gonna pass that to Maria. Um, mm -hmm. We did have reentry, and we it, it was we are not funded currently for okay. reentry. So, um, this mm -hmm. Yeah, just keep talking. I'll pick you up. Maria. Yeah. So, for 16 years, the Boston Police Department, in partnership with over 25 other agencies, ran one of the most successful reentry missions in the country. Um, we have partnered with. Case managers work behind the wall at Suffolk County House of Corrections. The last couple of years, we also added to that reentry model um, a model for uh, the House of Corrections um, uh, at the federal level. So that served populations older than 24. Mm -hmm. So before we closed shop on the two reentry models, there was one that served 18 to 24 and then 24 on. Both of them were extremely successful. If you need the numbers, we'll get you the numbers. Um, when Roca came to town, I think that the federal government got confused 
and had funded ROCA instead of the program that they were funding that was ours for 16 years, which was actually the city of Boston's uh, reentry program. And unfortunately, we lost the money in 2016 to, to ROCA. Um, however, since that time, we've utilized the Safe and Successful Youth Initiative as almost an ad hoc reentry model because the Safe and Successful Youth Initiative serves 18 to 24 um, very proven risk individuals who have gun records and very, very violent crime uh, backgrounds. And so what, through that, we have five case managers that, that are housed at the Boston Public Health Commission and they go behind the wall and they work with the same population that the Boston Reentry Initiative was working with before it closed in 2016. So we have more of an informal reentry model right now through the Safe and Sex Successful Youth Initiative. Thank, yeah, thank, thank you, Maria. Um, just a, a, a comment to the to the chair. Maybe maybe it's something as we head into the budget season next year of of looking at the reentry program and and seeing what we can do in terms yeah. of trying to fund the reentry program. So the Boston. Um, these dedicated employees here play a, a critical role, so uh, maybe we can work together yeah. on that, Council Flaherty. That'd be great. Thank um, you. I have, I have no further questions. Um, thank you. Thank, thank you. you for the important work you're doing. Thank, thank you, you. Council President. Anyone wishing to offer public testimony may do so now or forever hold your peace. Seeing and hearing no desire to do so. Checking with Christine. Anyone from the uh, Zoom world? It's very good. So that will conclude. Um, Testimony on uh, docket uh, 03, uh, actually 0274. And now we'll shift to docket 0349. And again, we've been joined by uh, Captain Kizmiski and Maria Chivas. So you guys have the floor to talk a little bit about um, that docket number, and we'll get into some questions. Welcome. Okay. Good afternoon. Thank you for having us here. Um, I'm Therese Kozmiski, Captain Detective. Uh, assigned to the Boston Police Family Justice Division. Um, in that division, I oversee uh, the Crimes Against Children Unit, the Domestic Violence Unit, the Sexual Assault Unit, and the Human Trafficking Unit. Um, quite a lot of good work that goes on. Um, today, I'll just recap. Um, I uh, respectfully ask you to approve an order authorizing the City of Boston to accept uh, and expend the amount of $150,000 in the form of a grant FY22 COVID-19 SADB Trust Fund awarded by the Mass Department of Public Health to be administered by the Foster Police Department. The grant would fund two full-time domestic violence advocates who will work with social service agency partners at the Boston Public Health Commission Family Justice Center. Um, just as a background, um, the Family Justice Center um, began operation in 2005, it was a, a joint um, um, endeavor um, with the Boston Police Department, the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office, uh, the Boston Public Health Commission, and several civilian um, service agencies. Um, the concept of it was to provide a broad array of direct services at a single location. Uh, when we did start, we um, had um, nine domestic violence advocates to cover the city. At this state, we only have five domestic violence advocates. Um, we have one in District C11 who is soon to retire, uh, one uh, um, in E5, and she also covers D14 and E18, one in B2, one in B3, and one uh, assigned to E E13, um, but she covers A7 and A15. Um, just, uh, we have quite a lot of about a thousand cases um, per month, and it heavily um, the cases that where the busiest districts are are in the area B2, B3, and C C11. And what the domestic violence ad advocates that would be hired from this grant would do would be to assist those districts. And what they do is um, they provide vital outreach support and safety planning to the victims. Um, the Boston Police has, uh, you know, a quality of service. We will respond to these calls and do the proper under Mass General Law um, 209A and make the proper arrests or provide services on site. But as a follow-up, after we leave, 
um, these domestic violence advocates will reach out to the victims and provide services. Um, they'll help them with explaining and assistance with restraining orders, um, help housing, uh, emergency shelters. Um, they'll also keep them updated on the case. Um, and any kind of crisis intervention as, uh, such as physical and mental health care, uh, assisting them and coordinating them with any kind of uh, cultural um, obstacles or, or, um, or language obstacles. Um, they'd associate them or connect them to the service providers that could be the most benefit to them. Um, and they just do extraordinary work. The detectives, the men and women, and the domestic violence unit do great work. But because of the amount of cases, they're often um, consumed with uh, court and other duties so that these advocates are, are really, really, uh, you know, just provide tremendous services to the victims that we ultimately serve. And, you know, I'm grateful to be assigned to this, this uh, unit. Captain of the Boston Police, because these victims um, just really need the, the best service that we can provide, and the addition of these two advocates uh, you know, would be great. Thank you, Captain Kosminski, for the work uh, that you're doing at the Family Justice Center. A question: uh, Where will these um, individuals? Where will they be housed? Are they um, going to be at the Family Justice Center? They're going to be in local district they're courts. They're going to be in local districts. Right now, all the domestic violence advocates are in the district, so they're assisting in the district. Um, these two particular will be in District um, B3 and B2, and they also will be assisting somewhat in, in C11 uh, due to that advocate uh, soon to retire. So we're hoping before she does retire that she can be assistance in training them because she's mm -hmm. a wealth of uh, knowledge. That's and who is that now? Um, that's oh, Evelyn Johnson. Evelyn Johnson. Yes. And so I guess the question, so then these two positions, um, they'll be, will they sort of kick into gear post arrest for domestic violence or Will they be available for the local courthouses for when someone approaches the counter of the clerk magistrate's office and they want to take out a complaint for an incident? Um, they, I mean, they're available to the victims as much as possible, mm -hmm. but uh, I think the courthouse have, have their own yeah. advocates through Suffolk County. Right. So this, <clears throat> excuse me, this advoca advocacy kicks off at incident report. So once an incident report is written out by a responding police officer, they check off DV onto that incident report. Gotcha. And then a copy of that report lands on the advocate's desk the next morning. And then they, they have, they may come into work on a Wednesday morning and there's maybe four reports. They'll start approaching the victim, the whether or not right the victim wants to, uh, the difference between these advocates and other advocates is if the, if the victim says, I don't want anything to do with the police, I don't want to do a restraining order, I don't want to press charges. These advocates are still by their side, yep, whatever perfect. decision they make, giving them the resources and the support that they need. Which is critical, obviously, at that juncture, because they have sort of... Um, it's Often a, don't want yeah. to report. They can be yeah, it's in a predatory sort of environment where they're more afraid. And, um, and then is there any specific training around sort of same-sex domestic violence? Uh, um, yes, and handling um, those situations. We have the um, we have the uh, gay men's domestic violence project as well as the network La Red that um, um, specializes in those areas or, or, or serves those uh, particular um, communities. Um, and then we have the Asian Task Force Against Domestic Violence, the Association of Asian Women in Boston, um, and Casa Myrna um, has been around for quite mm -hmm. a while. Um, those are the main ones, but there's several other ones, and if there's others that are available, um, through this grant, we're going to have a, uh, a multi-agency multi strategic planning group, and if something or, or another agency comes to light, then we will certainly um, include them and, and, and be welcoming them right. into And then why the grant is their, their full-time positions employed through uh, BPHC, why not? the Boston Police Department, why not the District Attorney's Office, why not? So the grant goes from the Massachusetts Department of Public Health to the BPD, and the BPD employs them. It is gotcha. the BPD. Yeah. The, the
the difference between this project and let's say Safe and Successful Youth Initiative is when we get those funds, we then give those funds to the Boston Public Health Commission, mm -hmm. who then hires the caseworkers. Okay. So their caseworkers are a pa pass through to the Public Health Commission. Mm -hmm. This grant allows us to hire them direct, and the reason we, we need these advocates, all of these advocates mm -hmm. that we talked about today to be hired direct is because we need these victims to be, to receive that outreach within 24 hours. Because if you wait too long to reach out to victims of domestic violence, they easily change their mind. Yep. And they, they don't want anyone right. to intervene and to try to offer them whatever right. that offering may be right. at, if you wait uh, after the 24 hour right. time period. And then will they be contract employees or will they be employees of the Boston Police they'll, Department? They'll be employees with the Boston Police Department, but because they're grant funded, there is a stipulation that says when the grant fund ends, their employment ends. Ends, gotcha. So they don't get the traditional So there's a constant protection. to continue to sort of continue it on. And then I'm assuming yeah. that there's going to be a, a, a sort of a genuine partnership between those domestic violence advocates and the ones that are assigned. Uh, through the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office that are in the courthouses uh, yes. and the sharing of information and yep. we've got a situation now where Boston Public Schools, they're not sharing information with our police department. They're, you know, not really calling when they should be calling. They're sort of taking matters into their own hands. They're weighing yep. which ones warrant to call and which ones don't. We don't want to be in any of that gray area. Right. We obviously well, want to make sure that if we have victim witness advocates that are working with the police department and then uh, there is an arrest or an arraignment that they're sharing that information yep. with the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office so that there's a continuum of right. outreach and services and victims knowing what their rights are and yep. how to proceed as opposed to, you know, this is my folder and this is sort of my client yep. and I'm not going to share this information and just want to make sure that there's going to be... Yeah, uh, so guess, we had to sign a confidentiality agreement as a part of the grant application and the confidentiality agreement is right here. Mm -hmm. And this stipulates by law all the rules and the procedures that we have to follow in order right. to um, abide by the law great. with regard to confidentiality. Right. And one of the early things in the policy is our DV advocates' um, explanation to the victims that they work with as to what exactly their role is and what the confidentiality mm -hmm. role is. And right. at that point, the victim can choose to sign a form that says you can have an open dialogue with the other great. victim advocate. That's awesome. So we've got it all covered. Perfect. And and if you need a copy, it's right Yeah, there. that'd be great to know, because obviously as the Chair of Public Safety, I'm, I plan to convene a meeting uh, once our uh, new police commissioner starts and once our new uh, school superintendent starts to convene a meeting just to make sure that uh, one, yeah. those two know each other and that uh, we're on the same page, unlike uh, um, um, the outgoing school superintendent and just the sort of the lack of communication with yeah law enforcement in really putting teachers and principals in a precarious position as to when they can and should call 911 right. when there's a violent incident taking place uh, on school grounds and or not cooperating when someone does call and please show up at the door. We, we can't have any of that. And that's really one of the big things that Desi uh, was, was on in terms of just the lack of right. sort of public safety awareness, particularly making sure that we're keeping our students safe while they're in school and also keeping uh, teachers safe and dealing with uh, those incidents uh, immediately yeah. as opposed to letting them fester. And what we did here, we've had a number of meetings and hearings, is that the, so the victims of bullying and the victims of violence, more often than not, they were the ones that were, that were basically forced to leave the school right. in search of safety and in search of you know, just trying to get a fresh start as opposed to you know, us dealing with uh, the actual problem in right. a particular classroom or a particular school environment. So for whatever reason, it just started to unravel. Um, you know, again, we've saw a number of incidents right. this school year where, you know, teachers would raise it to the principal. The principal wouldn't call 911. You know, you'd have parents right. calling 911. You'd have students calling 911. It was just, there needs to be sort of a better yeah, coordinated no effort. Yeah, there's no proactive right. planning. Right. And I think with this work that we've been doing over many years in the Boston Police with partners for, especially partners that we have in, in the area of gender violence, We've yep. been working with these organizations for over 20 years, and so right. um, with, with, in terms of the laws around confidentiality and sharing of information, our first go-to is to work with the survivors and Great. the victims to say, hey, we need a comprehensive plan here to put together, and we need you awesome. to be a part of that plan, and being a part of that plan means we'd like you to not only 
you know, give us permission to work with the other service yeah. providers to, to, to support you, but have you as a part of that conversation right. with how, what kind of support do you need? What, what do you want now? And, right. and things like that. So the people themselves have to be involved in that right. planning and, and give I, permission for you to share information with others. Right. And then uh, a best case scenario, obviously we're meeting, I believe it's, uh, we have a meeting next week and then uh, next week, uh, two, uh, within two weeks, when uh, the 10th, August the 10th, so when, when do you envision sort of, you know, this process starting so when we could get these so people started? It, it, once we get city council approval, we can then begin taking the, the, uh, the contract and the budget to the city budget office. Right. Once they set up the budget within Perfect. the budget office, we go to HR. HR then takes the job descriptions, approves them, then they go to PRC. Mm -hmm. Hopefully PRC will be qu with the quickness gotcha. and do that quickly. I would hope to have these two positions on board walking in the door by uh, within the next six months, because it takes that long sometimes to hire people. Okay. But once they get in those positions, they're going to need a little training, gotcha. and they're going to obviously be matched with seasoned DV advocates Great. for a while before Great. they're on their own. And then immediately apply for yeah. another grant, right? That the, so <laughs> constantly kind of keep it going. So. Exactly. Council President, any questions of the panel? Thank you, Councilor Flaherty, and thank you, Captain, and thank you, Maria, for the important work that, that you're doing. I had the opportunity, Captain, to visit the Family Justice Center twice over the last four years, I guess, and had the opportunity to tour it, but also to talk to some of the staff there that, that work there, and was just impressed by the professionalism and the, the hard work and caring attitude they they had so just want to recognize the team over there captain um one question i had and, and i think you mentioned it, captain um a, a group i work with i represent chinatown and a group i work with is the asian task force against domestic violence and i met with the director or executive director her name is dawn and i remember speaking to her i said dawn what's the biggest um challenge you have as the director with um, dealing with the large immigrant community, dealing with the uh, Asian community, obviously. And she said, well, one of the biggest challenges we have is the language barriers, because the Asian community, there could be 20 or 30 different languages spoken. Um, also, immigration issues, unfortunately, play, play a part in it. But I'm, um, I'm just Ask, just just want to know, Captain, um, you know, how can we be more proactive in, in helping survivors of domestic violence that, and I know we're doing our best, um, but how can we help survivors of domestic violence, especially those that may not speak, speak English? Just um, actually uh, one of these uh, advocates we're looking to hire, we're going to see if that we can find someone that may speak Cantonese, Spanish, or Portuguese. So that would be, you know, for us to, um, you know, reach out and, and really be proactive in hiring someone that's multilingual. Uh, we, all, we always have the translation line. I know most of my career was in the Bureau of Field Services. Mm -hmm. And I was assigned downtown here in A1 on a midnight shift, but you know we had difficulty responding um, to incidents in Chinatown just because of the language barrier. And I had three offices that were of Asian descent, but sometimes just that um, dialect is just so different, it's really difficult. But we do, fortunately, even in those inst instances, we could, we had the services of the translation line. Mm -hmm. But um, also just to uh, just keep supporting all our uh, civilian service providers. I think that's uh, even like with the uh, president was just mentioning with the school um, issues. Um, we we're, we're focused on on providing services to the victims with victim centered policing. Um, it's a it's a good concept and it's just 
you know, doing the best that we can do and, and, and continuing to provide and to evolve into um, the best that we can be as, as a police department with the services and the, and the connections to our partner agencies that may not be in law enforcement, um, encouraging um, uh, victims uh, uh, that uh, maybe not be here legally or are afraid of uh, due to their culture of the police. Um, any, any kind of programs like that or, or, or assistance that we can uh, provide using our partners, um, you know, just I can't, I can't encourage, you know, enough for, for our department and um, you know, hope, I hope that uh, in the future we can, uh, you know, really lead in that, in that fashion uh, with uh, partnerships with our, our fellow agencies uh, to provide service. Thank, thank you, Captain. Um, my, my final question or, or comment, I guess, um, maybe, maybe Maria, you, you might want to answer this, is um, so the $150,000 for two, two staff people, um, so, that, so that's a 12-month that's a period? Is no, that right? that was a, that's a, a, a three-year period. Oh, that's a three. So that covers salary and fringe, and then whatever's left over for two positions, and then whatever, they're also set aside some funding so that the monthly meeting that we're going to have with all the service providers will include survivors, and those survivors will be paid to help us build a system that is more, more um, user-friendly for survivors. And so there's going to be a sti some of the money will be used for stipends for the survivors to sit on that. Uh, monthly meeting for that task force, uh, which will improve response and collaboration between law enforcement and service providers that work with domestic violence victims. Um, I think it also includes a laptop for each DV advocate okay. uh, and some supplies. So it's two full-time positions, salary, fringe, stipends for survivors, and some supplies for the, um, for the two v DV advocates. Yeah, thank you, Maria. Maria. When, I, when I was at Superior Court, I know it was the domestic violence, but also the victim witness assistant. I think the victim witness was out of us, the DA's office um, for the domestic violence, but I know the critical role that they play yeah. in, in helping, helping the survivors. Um, so, so my final question is, I mean, you'd hate to lose someone because the grant money ran out. Is there anything that we can do, just looking long term, about? And as 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 I asked the chair earlier, but is there anything that we can think about doing long term, so we don't lose good people that are that are doing a great job working working for the residents of the city? And you'd hate to lose someone because we we ran out of federal money. I'd rather yeah. the city, you know then come in and pay the, the rest after the, the grant runs out. Um, but is this something that we can prioritize, um, you know, as we head into the next budget season? I mean, it, to be honest with you, we've been playing the shell game with these DV yeah. funds since the mid-1990s. Okay. Our first grant was a COPS grant, and uh, I think we had like three or four advocates that we got from the COPS office. And then when the COPS office money ran out, we went over to to the state, and the state covered us for a while, and then we went back to the federal government, and it's constantly a shell game, and the truth of the matter is each district has about 1,100 domestic violence calls for service a year. When you multiply that by 12 districts, we're, we're, the phones are off the hook mm -hmm. on domestic violence calls, and I really do think that it would behoove the city to have 12 solid DV advocates, one in each district, uh, as part of the operating budget, because the amount of work that each of these DV advocates c bring to the table when they have 1,100 case files on their desk on an annual basis that they have to respond to, that they have to call these victims all up on and help them regardless of where these victims are in terms of what they want to do to move forth. Um, I would like to see, and I believe I am speaking to some extent for the Boston Police Department, would like to see these be operating budget permanent positions um, and not by the whim of whether or not one administration cares about gender violence and another administration doesn't. Um, this is, this is, these are critical positions and, and should be on the operating budget. 
Well, I, I think that's well well stated as the city council president. I I support that 100%, Maria, and I know the exceptional work that the city of Boston, Boston Police Department plays on domestic violence issues. They play a critical role in making sure that cases are investigated properly, but also providing the follow-up services to the um, survivor of domestic violence, too. So the Boston Police plays a critical role, and they, they do an exceptional job at it because I've, I've seen them, I've visited the, the location several times, but more important, importantly than that, I've seen them as a probation officer, the important work they play at the courthouse, but also um, making sure that the survivor is treated with respect and dignity. So just want to thank the um, Boston Police for the important work they continue to do on domestic violence related um, issues. Um, Mr. Chair, I have no further comment. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, anyone wishing to offer public testimony may do so now or forever hold your peace. Seeing and hearing no one looking to uh, testify publicly in chamber. Um, checking with Christine, no one on the Zoom. So that will conclude uh, testimony with respect to uh, docket 0349. Uh, I'll just use this opportunity briefly on the sort of the grant writing size of the house. If and they can be done to secure some uh, some additional funding uh, for our 911 operators and dispatchers who are working long days and long nights under very stressful conditions, playing a vital function, coordinating information, not just for police, but for fire and EMS. Uh, many of them who don't get weekends off, they're not mm -hmm. even in a rotation. They should have a schedule that's consistent with uh, sort of police and fire where they at least, for their own sake and for the sake of their families, they can enjoy a, a sad day and a Sunday. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know how that system is broken, but if we can collectively, uh, as Chair of Public Safety, Council President, and uh, you folks and whoever else needs to be at the table, if we can sort of, uh, I guess, restore some sense to that process and some dignity, frankly, to those positions, because we're gonna lose some very talented uh, individuals just through the uh, the wear and tear, I guess, uh, right. and, uh, and the stress of the job, but yeah. uh, it's a solvable problem. Uh, we need to sort of supplement uh, those depleting ranks, and we need to have a schedule that's just consistent with uh, allowing individuals to have uh, some semblance of a life outside of 911. Your calls, your calls being recorded, or 911. You know, what's your state of your emergency? Um, and how they often kind of just get overlooked. So we're here, these are obviously very important grants uh, that are making a difference uh, in our communities, but oftentimes our 911 dispatchers kind of, they get, uh, and I don't know what we can do collectively, but I'm gonna continue to, to bang the pots and pans on that because um, I know that as more of them are just, tra they're transitioning off the jobs, they're going to other jurisdictions, and again, we're losing bright, talented, committed, passionate individuals um, and, uh, and I don't want to sort of be Monday morning quarterbacking with I, right. I could have, should have, would have, and I told you so. We know the issue. We know the problem. We need to find funding to support our 911 operators and dispatchers. We needed to do it yesterday, and I just don't know how collectively moving forward we can identify um, support and help for them. But count mm -hmm. me in as the chair of public safety. Count the council president in. Count this body in. During the budget hearing, we raised that a number of different times. Uh, everyone agrees that there's an issue and a problem over there, but no one's been able to tackle it with both uh, manpower, um, basic fairness uh, right. it's a pay around scheduling. Issue at this point. Yeah. So Among it's, other issues, it's a pay issue. Yes. So we're gonna figure that out. So anyways, I'll opine on that, but then just uh, obviously uh, with respect to these, it's always great to see you guys, of course, and uh, appreciate the work that you uh, all do uh, in making a big difference uh, with our city and the police department. And with respect to those dockets, uh, both uh, the dockets we discussed today, that's docket 0349 and docket 0247, uh, the Committee on um, Public Safety will be adjourned. We'll, like, similar to the uh, fire uh, grants, we'll get these turned around and committee report before the council on our next council meeting, which will be August 10th. Try to get those funds to you ASAP so you can continue to kind of just turn the wheel and get folks plugged in over yep. there. So thank you again for your time and attention. And uh, with respect to all of these dockets, uh, docket uh, 
0349-0375-0348 and uh, 0247. The Committee on Public Safety will be adjourned. Thank you. Thank you so much. Enjoy your rest of the afternoon.